Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. I'm really excited about today's guest, Omar Zini. Omar is a goalkeeper coach who is doing a good job bringing training and video to people through social media. I first met him at Camp Shutout last summer. And then I spent a week with him at the United Soccer Coaches Convention in Baltimore. Omar is also Muslim, and this being his holy month, Ramadan, I wanted to learn a bit more about it. We talk quite a bit about his faith and how he trains and performs as an athlete. It is important that as players and coaches, we know how to support our teammates and friends through understanding more about their backgrounds and cultures. Even though I'm Christian, it is important I know and respect the beliefs of other people. Omar makes some excellent points, too, including about how it is very important to always do your best work with your best effort. Today's guest is Omar Zini. He's a goalkeeper coach with Pro GK Academy and co-host of the popular podcast Inside the Eight Team. I met Omar last year at Camp Shutout, and I spent a couple of days alongside him again at the United Soccer Coaches Convention in Baltimore this January. As a coach, Omar has been able to work alongside some incredible talent in California. He is always looking to share and expand his knowledge with others. Omar did play for the LA Galaxy Academy as a youth before going on to play four years at UC Davis. Unfortunately, a knee injury put his playing on hold and he started to find his path as a GK coach. We'll talk a little bit about his background and his coaching, but I really wanted to bring him on to learn more about the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. So Omar, is there any little background information you'd like to share in, that I may have missed? No, everything was good. Everything was good. Uh, I, I also have my own podcast as well, uh, Pro GK Podcast. I do both throughout the quarantine time. I've been able to interview some some top coaches and top players and kind of get their knowledge and uh, methodologies and philosophies and, and how they approach the position. So uh, while the quarantine time may have been, you know, it's, it's tough for us not to be on the field. I think it's been a really good opportunity for a lot of us coaches to share. And um, yeah, it's been awesome to to get uh, these kind of conversations going and really expand our knowledges versus just having our own mindset and, and thought processes. So on this podcast, I always start with the same three questions. So first, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Oh man, everything about the beautiful game. It means, it means everything to me. I think, uh, I mean, even after I stopped playing, I was definitely lost. And I think if you ask anybody who, um, you know, has to make that tough decision of what do I do after I'm done playing, I think they all can tell you that they feel lost and they don't really have much to fill that void because their attention has been focused on uh, playing for their whole lives. And I think we all have this naive idea that it's going to last forever. But uh, once I was done with that, I tried to do other jobs. I tried to do, you know, corporate jobs. I tried to do things that were out of my comfort zone, but just nothing really made me feel whole anymore. And all of a sudden, you know, my mom sat me down and she said, look, you know, you love goalkeeping, you love coaching. Let's try and mix those two together. Uh, one thing led to another and I found myself back into into the, the game. And again, for me, the beautiful game means everything to me because it's hard for me to leave it. And as you can see now through my channel, through videos, through sessions that I do, um, if you don't love it, you're not going to really put 110 percent in it. And I really feel like I found my passion. So the beautiful game means everything to me. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Um, I try not to take everything too seriously. Um, I mean, my personality is very loose and joyful, and I think sometimes I have to walk that, you know, that fine line of being too friendly with some of the kids that I train, but at the same time to uh, come down hard on them and be stern with them so that they, they understand the discipline and hard work and the right attitude uh, is important. So for me, when I have my sessions, I just really try to keep things loose and make sure that uh, we all know that once we step between those four lines, that it's, it's all business. Um, and I think from my academy days, my goalkeeper coach was very serious and sometimes took the fun away from things. Um, then, I got to the, the, then I got to UC Davis and my goalkeeper coach there was really loose, but um, you know, his personality was, was joyful and, and made sure that we had fun. But once we stepped on the field, it was, okay, it's business. His demeanor completely changed. So I felt, you know what, if I could couple a little bit of discipline from my goalkeeper coach of the Galaxy, to the kind of joyfulness and silliness that my goalkeeper coach at Davis brought, I could definitely find my way and, and filter the good and the bad between those two. And I feel 
now whenever I step on the field, my goalkeepers know that, you know, when I put them through, through drills and through sessions, that I love, the, I love what I'm doing and I'm trying to bring the best of them, but also, too, that they're bringing a certain energy to me as well so that we're beating each other halfway and um, we're both taking things seriously. So I think that's how I kind of keep things as, as beautiful as I can, per se. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? Um, it's, and it's different uh, for everybody. Honestly, I think that's something that I've learned a lot from this quarantine part or this quarantine uh, uh, situation where a lot of different people have come on my podcast and, and mentioned certain things about their coaching style and their philosophy and stuff that I wouldn't necessarily do because I don't know if I'm that uh, ruthless sometimes. But, you know, there's people who definitely, you know, don't take any laughing or joking or silliness on the field. And um, for me, I, I don't mind that. But, again, I have to make sure that we draw that line in the sand of, like, look, you know, it could be fun, but we have to make things serious. Um, so I think everybody has their own way of maneuvering that fine line. Um, personally, I think to advise everybody just to make sure that when you go out there that we remember the game is, is to us since we were kids, is just a fun environment. And the number one thing is, it needs to be fun. If it's not fun anymore, then why are we playing it? You know, why are we doing it? And I think the way I coach and the way I used to play was I just loved, um, I mean, you see now on my channel, I'm like obsessed with goalkeeping. I'll watch clips from 2005 of Oliver Kahn, you know, training with Bayern Munich. And to me, I don't feel like I'm wasting my time because I truly love it. So at the foundation of anything that, that happens in goalkeeping or it happens in the game, it has to be fun. And I think the the coaches are the first ones to come in with that attitude and that, foundation and set it early so that uh, the kids can really feel that and then from there once you have their attention because they're having fun then you can really start um, throwing in different techniques and, and philosophies at them and hopefully because of that they're more receptive. So I really brought you on today to talk a bit about Ramadan so could you first start out and talk about what is Ramadan? Yeah so it's the uh, so I'm Muslim uh, my dad is Lebanese my mom is Mexican um, so I grew up uh, as a Muslim and I've been, been fasting ever since I was probably eight or nine years old. And it's, you know, the holy month of 30 days. And it's essentially for us, it's just, you know, that sacrifice and trying to kind of understand that we have um, things in our daily lives that are priorities. And I think for us now, even with this quarantine now, it's become a time where we want to spend time with our families. We want to make sure that uh, we understand there are people in this world that are going through a lot of trials and tribulations and things that they can't really control, whether it's socio socioeconomic situations or just situations that they were kind of born into um, because of where they were born. So the, remind, uh, the month for me, at least, is, is a reminder of that and understanding that um, we can do our part. And we have something at the end of the month uh, called zakat, which means that we have to give, I, forget, I don't know the percentage, but it's like a certain percentage of our, our salary to donation because uh, we want to make sure that we uh, are are thinking of those who are going through challenging times. And I think that's for us why we fast, because we want to make sure that we understand that there are people out there who aren't you know, able to get water, aren't able to get food on command. They, we do it here, but there are people around the world that don't have that. So it's a reminder for us. And it's 30 days. We wake up usually around 3, 30, 4 in the morning. We have our little breakfast and then uh, do a prayer. And then the sun, you know, will come up. We can't eat or drink until the sun goes down. So here in California, it's about 7.30 p.m. Um, so, yeah, you know, normally it would just be us running around doing our daily stuff. And then at night we come home and have our dinner. Uh, but now with the quarantine, it's a little bit more, uh, a little more grim. We really spend a lot more time together, which has been awesome. And I think that's something that I've taken away from this uh, Ramadan more than any others. Do all Muslims celebrate the same? Um, I would say, I would say most of them do. I would say most of them do. I think, uh, the biggest, you know, the, the takeaway for me, I think when I get older and I have kids, I'll probably have a little bit more, uh, spirituality that comes through it. But for me, it's, you know, I, I do, I fast and I'm very spiritual on my own, but the community to me is just the community gets together really, really well during the run of Ramadan, like Friday, Saturdays and Sundays, we go to friends' houses, we break our fast with them. And to me, our community gets closer because of Ramadan. So, you know, we have 11 months or, you know, 10 and a half months because it moves up every two or every year. It moves up two weeks. So maybe like 10 and a half months, we all uh, have our own thing. Everyone's doing whatever, whatever they need to do. And then for those for that 30 days, everybody's seeing each other on weekends. And um, my community all celebrates the same, uh, I would say. But there are the people who maybe celebrate a little bit differently. But, yeah, sun up to sundown is, is pretty. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty common from uh, from from anywhere you are. You meet up a lot and get and go over to people's houses on weekends. What do you do now instead? 
Uh, you know, we do a lot of these Zoom calls, Anna. We, we, we talk to each other all the time, and we want to uh, stay connected. And uh, it's definitely a rough time. I think, again, Ramadan is not easy. But what makes it, you know, easier or easier for us to get through is when we get to see our friends and family. Because um, we are, you know, for example, I'll take you through a regular Friday night. My friends and I will have dinner. And then we'll go to like a, a lounge and just hang out for a little bit, probably for like two, three hours. And then we're having dinner or having like a early breakfast at like one in the morning at a Denny's or IHOP or something like that. So those are the kind of moments where, you know, we have stories that we tell each other uh, over the years of like, remember that one time at like one in the morning we had this and, you know, it's just like those moments that I really, I really am, am going to miss. And right now it's just uh, obviously we want to stay safe. We want to stay quarantined for as long as we need to, but we have those zoom calls. We have phone calls, see how they're doing, how their family's doing. And um, again, it's, it's, it really tries it, it, it this kind of situation kind of weeds out who the real friends are, I think, because you really make that effort. And I think that's the beauty of this whole thing is you really make that effort to stay close to your friends. And um, that's what I'm really enjoying about the whole process. So can you explain what it was like growing up when fasting, but also playing? Yeah, honestly, it was, uh, it was difficult. I think early on I did it because, you know, I saw my parents doing it and I thought it was cool. Um, so I got used to it when I was younger and, and, and maybe it just kind of instilled a little bit of discipline in me. Um, so as I got older, it was never something that I questioned. I just said, you know what, I'm going to do it. You know, let's, let's, you know, for this month, this one month, let's make sure that we're, uh, waking up early, having our breakfast and, uh, just taking care of our body. So I was really into drinking a lot of water, staying hydrated. And every time I had a game, I think, let's say it was early in the morning, it was a little bit easier. But as the days you know went by, and let's say we had a game, I remember one time we played against this team from uh, West Coast FC in Mission Viejo, and it was at like a 3 p.m. game, so right in the middle of the day. And I had one of my best games I think I've, I had ever played. And people like walked up to the car and were like, "We can't believe you're fasting, and we don't, you know, how how is this possible?" And I was like, honestly, in my head, I was like, I think because I was so like extra focus and I was like overcompensating I felt like that really helped me out because all the little details all the little things I really tried to to fine tune and make sure that I was on point because I didn't want to use the excuse that I was fasting um, and I think you know as a person I sometimes have those characteristics of like looking for the easy way out and I felt like during Ramadan I just really was able to clamp and, and just step into a zone that said, you know what, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but let's make it easier on ourselves by staying focused for that hour and a half. And then once that hour and a half passes, then we can ease up a little bit. So yes, it was tough, but I think it ingrained a lot of little things in me from a young age to make sure that I set out my breakfast plan, make sure that I was hydrated. So I did all the little things that sure, maybe my parents may have brought up to me and said, hey, we're going to encourage you to do this so that the games are easier for you and you don't have to worry about being like malnourished or anything like that. But at the same time, too, like I had to make sure those were action items for me and it was great. And then I got to college and that was the difficult one. I think that I took it a little bit easier. I didn't fast as often, only on the days that I really needed to um, when we had days off or things like that, because it was uh, obviously I'm competing for a job now. I have a scholarship at Davis, so I needed to make sure that I was at my uh, you know, peak abilities. And I felt like sometimes if I wasn't you know, hydrated or eating the right foods, then I probably wasn't at my best. So I needed to kind of sacrifice those days. But it's important that you make those up. There's, there's, you know, you have obviously 10 and a half months to make up the days that you don't fast and um, you can do it whenever. And that's the beauty, I think, of it. How can teammates support you while you're fasting? Um, I think, you know, it's just uh, obviously being knowledgeable on it. I think there are some times where players won't, uh, they won't really know what you're going through. So just having patience with you. Like I remember when I was at the Galaxy, you know, we used to train Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and my mom used to have like a bucket of water with like a Snickers bar, like a protein bar on the sideline. And so, you know, we'd go through the whole, the whole session and probably like an hour in, my coach was like, hey, and I need to go break your fast, go do it real quick, we'll wait for you. So the session would continue and they'd, you know, continue to do reps, but I'd run off to the side, I'd have my, like my protein bar, drink some water. Um, and my teammates were very supportive. You know, they saw that and they said, hey, like if you need, if you need any more rest, if you need any more breaks, uh, or you need anything, if you want to come serve instead of uh, being goal, you let us know. So I think it's just being knowledgeable. And I think from the top down, when it comes to uh, the goalkeeper coach, is, if they're knowledgeable on it and they have that open you know, line of communication with the goalkeeper and say, look, I, I need to know what you're going through. Or even a field player, like tell me what you're going through. And if you need any, any water, if you need anything, you let me know. Um, and I think that to me was always like, how far can I push this where maybe I'm about to pass out? 
Um, and we used to do something called shooting clinic before I got to uh, before I got to the Galaxy, where I was on this club team. And they used to have, I think, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, they'd have shooting clinic where the, the shooters would pay, and the coach would drop the ball from different angles, and the goalkeepers would just come for free. So I remember I would step in there for an hour and just take shot after shot after shot. And to me, I think I don't know why, but I think early on it really developed like that that level of discipline for me, like understanding that I'm putting myself through this situation, and I need to find with it, find it within me to get myself out of the situation. So. Um, I think I, I developed a lot of mental skills um, and got better with the discipline and got better with that, you know, overcompensation of just really fine, you know, getting into that zone and really uh, fine tuning the little details. Um, but it was also because the coaches said, Hey, I know you just took a few reps, go take a, take a break. Or like the goalkeepers um, that were working with me, they said, Hey, like, I know you need some water, go get some, go get some water real quick. So again, just that open line of communication. And um, as, as a player for myself, just, you know, expanding their knowledge a little bit more of what I'm going through and, uh, where my mindset is at every session so that they have more information to be able to help me. Is the playing style or like the competitive competitiveness different during Ramadan? Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, I, the, the way I've been saying it, yes, I would say, yeah, it is a little bit different um, just because you're, you know, I think because you're fasting and because you have so many little obstacles in front of you, whether it's shortness of breath or kind of lightheadedness because you haven't eaten or drinking all day. I think that is when you start really um, trying to make the game easier for you. And I think to me, I mean, something that I can rec uh, recall from the game that I was telling you about earlier against West Coast is that I remember it was like a 1v1 and I didn't have that much energy for some, I mean, not for some reason, but I didn't have that much energy and I didn't move. Like I kind of just stood there on a 1v1 and the guy shot it like right at my chest and it went out of bounds for a corner. And I think at that very moment, something triggered in my mind of like, oh, my God, maybe just standing sometimes and being still and having stability and not moving and just being disciplined by stand, like standing upright or standing in a lower position makes them obviously have to hit a, hit a smaller target because I'm not leaning or moving. At the same time, too, it gives me the control in the situation. So I think in that sense, yeah, it made the game a lot easier for me because I wasn't trying to do more than I needed to because I needed to conserve my energy. Um, and yeah, that's funny that's, that you bring that up because like in my head I started remembering all the little things that I was like, okay, you know, if I'm doing a volley from the coach or I'm getting a shot from the ground, how can I make sure that I don't double, you know, double catch the ball? I catch it in one, uh, in one, you know, in one take, so no re-gripping or dropping it or you know, side to get down. And I remember I was like getting volleys and I needed that extra second. I said, okay, you know, coach, I need that extra second just to make sure that I'm not dropping the ball and I'm not uh, having a lapse of judgment because I'm like you know, dehydrated or whatever. So they shoot the ball and I would really focus to make sure that I saw the ball all the way into my hands. Then I throw the ball back. So little things like that, where I think making the game easier on myself because I was forced into that situation, I think really um, made me realize that there were better ways and more optimal ways for me to be successful as a goalkeeper. And that was making the game easier on myself, not taking too many risks, um, just keeping everything simple. So yeah, I think I think the way that I played and the way I approached the position, whether I knew it or not at that age, definitely um, was caused because of uh, because of fasting. Did you ever struggle to tell your coach that you needed a break or anything? Absolutely, yeah. I think again, it's it's you know you're kind of competing against yourself. I would say. So for me, it was like okay, you know, last session I was in the zone in the shooting clinic where you know we spent an hour and maybe I would probably be in the goal for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And I remember there were times where I would go, okay, you know what, I, because long story short, when it comes to shooting clinic, you don't exit the goal for the other goalkeeper until they score on you. So there were times where, I, you know, they would take probably like five or six shots and I'd make really good saves and I'd pop back up, make another save. And to me, I was always thinking about, okay, how many shots can I save in a row uh, to, to, you know, ext extend my, my total here. So I used to do shooting clinics twice a week, you know, for let's say eight times every Ramadan. And every time I'd go out there, I'd, you know, continuously put the range higher and higher and higher. And my, my goalkeeper coach or the coach at the time who was uh, serving the balls for the shooters, which like, Omar, if you need a break, step out. I know you're fasting. If you need a break, step out. And I'd be like, no, I think I'm good. You know, I think for me, it's, it's about, can I get to 10 saves in a row? Can I get to 12 saves in a row? Can I keep on pushing the, the envelope a little bit more? Um, so I think uh, to me, again, it was, I knew what I was getting myself into and I knew the task at hand and obviously it was to get to sundown and make sure that I uh, didn't break my fast. But to me, it was about pushing my limits and just seeing how, how much of my stamina and how much do I have in me and how much, uh, uh can I really push to the, to the, to the edge? 
Um, and again, I, that was something that I just kind of did innately. I felt maybe it was just, you know, an ego thing or just trying to be macho. Cause I wanted to show to the other goalkeepers that like, there's no excuses that you guys shouldn't be taking these many reps because I'm fasting and you're not, uh, could have been that, or it could have just been that, you know, I wanted to prove to myself, I think a little bit of both, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I ever really made an excuse for it. I just kind of just kept pushing. What advice would you give to a player almost afraid to talk to their coach and tell them they need a break? I think, again, open transparency is the biggest thing because the worst thing you want to do is you know start the session and you're not feeling it. And from the get-go, the coach is like, okay, what's going on with this goalkeeper? What's going on with this player? Why is Omar not uh, sharp today? What's going on with Anna? Like, can we figure, you know, they need to understand the more information, like you talked about earlier, telling your teammates and telling your coaches, the more information you give to your coaches and your teammates, the better they are, the more well-equipped they are to help you when things kind of go down or go sour. Um, So, yeah, just if you have the opportunity, talk to your coach. If you don't feel comfortable uh, talking to your coach one-on-one because maybe you don't want to seem weak in front of them, um, maybe tell your parents and say, hey, do you mind uh, coming with me to talk to the coach? I just want to, you know, chat about going through fasting and letting him know that if I do seem weak or I do seem a little bit tired, it's because I'm fasting. Um, So open transparency and, and just making sure that if you can't do it on your own, maybe bring your parents. And again, at the end of the day, you know, you're observing a holy month and you're doing a certain thing for your religion. And I think there are a lot of other religions that are, you know, do, observing their certain uh, months or their certain days. And I think, you know, we're all, uh, as humanity, I feel, should be receptive to that and open to that. Um, but they can't be receptive and open to it unless you are transparent and are willing to, to discuss that. So that's what I would say. Are you able able to properly recover from an injury during Ramadan? Um, I don't think you would. I, I never really had, to be honest with you, I never really had an injury during Ramadan. Um, so I, I never really needed to take medicine or I never really needed to, you know, do certain rehab that would uh, force my body into, I guess, uh, needing water or needing food. But I would say that if you, you know, if you feel like you need to break your fast, or if you feel like you need to um, stay in shape or go through rehab or um, do maintenance work on your injury and you need that medicine or you need the the water and the hydration because you're working out very hard, I would definitely say, you know, use that time and be smart about it. Think about what your limits are. And if you feel like you can push your limits without needing to d- break your fast, then go for it. But you can always make, uh, make up those days um, later in the year. So again, it's about, I think at the end of the day, day two, Anna, it's about your personality and what you feel like you can take. And I think that is an underlying like thing about Ramadan for me, at least, is understanding how much can I take? What is my body uh, used to? And if it can't take, you know, a certain, a certain amount of uh, just exhaustion and training, then maybe I can reevaluate the next day and say, look, today maybe not be the, may not be the best day for me to fast. I need to probably take my health into consideration. Boom, you take, you know, let's say a week, two weeks. And then from there, um, throughout the year, you can make it up. And I think at a younger age, I think the parents will probably be a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more of a pulse on what their kids' uh, decisions are, because obviously you're in that parental role and you want to make sure your kids are smart and and not uh, sacrificing their health. But at the same time, as you get a little bit older, and I've done that in the past where I'm like, ah, you know what, maybe I'll just sleep a little bit more today and I don't need to do the medicine stuff. Or, okay, you know what, hey, maybe this is an opportunity where I I need to take care of myself take the medicine and, you know, hit, the, hit that recovery um, the way it's properly or the way I'm supposed to. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But I think, yeah, it's, it's person to person. But I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to advise anything. But if you feel like you can, go for it. And if you feel like you can't, make up the days. How can you tell when you've pushed your body too far? Yeah, again, it's, it's everybody has their own their own limits. And I think for me, whenever I had those moments, I kind of started feeling a little bit fatigued and a little bit uh, just kind of drowsy and, and kind of like falling over here and there where, again, that would be the conversation that I had with my coaches or my teammates. Like, look, if you see me kind of not feeling too hot or I'm not just not looking like myself, just make sure that you have me sit down. And I used to have like little cold towels that I would bring in this little like jug that had ice in it. And just like, let me put a cold towel on my forehead or on my back or on my, on my neck. And they would say, yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll make sure of that. And so throughout the days, I obviously would take care of myself. I would, it would nap if I need to after school or do whatever I had to do. And then when I got to training, I just, again, I, I snapped into like this zone where I was like, okay, it's game time. Let's do it. So yeah, again, it's making sure that you have that open communication. And if you feel like 
you are feeling a little bit weary or you're feeling a little bit like, hey, I'm dehydrated, then you got to take responsibility for what you feel is right. And again, that conversation with those coaches is going to make your decision to take a rest a lot easier. And I, I used, what, I, what ended up happening with me or like my brother or my sister or anybody that I used to know is they would, again, step on the field trying to, to not tell anybody. And when coaches or teammates were like, wait, what's going on with Omar today? Why is he not playing the way he needs to be playing? Then they would start you know, making assumptions or drawing conclusions that because they didn't have the information were probably justified in their minds. But to you, it's like, hey, I'm going through something. You need to understand. But again, they can't understand until you bring that up. So full transparency. And then once that transparency is there, you have as much freedom as you need to, to make sure that your health um, is at the forefront and stays uh, your priority. So I know you not only fast from food, but what else do you kind of fast from? So you fast from food, you fast from liquids, um, you know, certain temptations. Uh, for example, like, you know, some people who like to gamble, like you can't gamble during Ramadan. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that, you know, you, you wouldn't want to do during Ramadan as well. So I think it's, it's a really big month for discipline and just making sure that whatever things that, let's say, are your, your norms throughout the day, making sure that you can hold off on those until the afternoon or until the evening, obviously until you can break your fast. So I think the biggest lesson I've taken away from it. And I think my friends have taken away from it is just sacrificing um, certain things because again, there are people around the world that don't have, you know, certain things that they can just, you know, step into a car or they can just, sorry, not a car, but they can, you know, step in and, and have water whenever it is accessible to them, or they can just have food whenever they want. Um, and I think for us, our day-to-day lives, we've been kind of spoiled with all those little amenities that necessarily we don't always need. Um, And I think the discipline to, you know, just take that extra breath and go, you know what, I'm going to stay away from this. I'm going to refrain from this until the afternoon, until the, you know, the day is over. Um, So just making sure that you have your priorities set out straight from the beginning of the day and just making sure that those little things that you don't need or the things that you need to refrain from until uh, obviously food and water are the main ones. Um, until until the afternoon, and then uh, from there, then you can kind of go, okay, and then I can I can reward myself in a sense. So I know you talked a little bit about feeling lost after your big injury a while ago. Could you just cover a little bit about when you got injured? Yeah, so um, after my senior season, which was, let's say, December 20, uh, 2013, I got – a phone call that, uh, cause I was in the galaxy Academy and over that summer before my senior year. So let's say July, 2013, I was actually fasting this time too. And they, they called us back and they said, Hey, we're going to try and bring back, uh, probably like 20 of you guys who were on the Academy team who are going to be going into the pro, uh, the combines and all that stuff after your senior years. want to bring you guys in just to have like a little bit of a camp over the summer, probably like a month camp and just get to know you guys a little bit more just in case we wanted to draft you or, you know, sign you guys as homegrown players. Um, so, you know, we went in, we did all of our training and I was, I was fasting at the time too. And I remember after every session, I, you know, went up there, took a cold shower, made sure that I uh, just had, cause I, you can gargle water. So I just wanted to like make sure my mouth was not just completely dry. So I would gargle water, spit it out and then, you know, take a little bit of a rest. And then um, after that, I drive home and then the rest of the day was, you know, we had set training at 9 a.m rest of the day was a relaxing time, not doing anything too um, crazy for my body, just relaxing. And then I remember they said, Hey guys, look, after your seasons are done, we're going to let you guys know that we may draft some of you guys or assign you to homegrown contracts because we have a uh, USL team starting the galaxy too. So just, you know, make sure you guys are understanding that if we want you guys, you know, there, there could be better opportunities and better money for you because you are homegrown players. So with all that in mind, uh, my season ends. And they call me around mid-December and they say, hey, Omar, uh, we want you to come into a, uh, a Galaxy 2 open tryout. Not open tryout, but like a guest tryout and, and invite only. So I said, yeah, perfect. Okay, I'll come through. And I think like the first or second week of January, we were still on winter break. I went to the camp and um, I had done pretty well. And they called me five or six days later when I was back in Davis. And they said, hey, Omar, you know, we want you to um, – to come, come join us for the season. Uh, we were have preseason in about uh, two weeks or in, in close to a month. We want you to come out and, and join us. And I said, okay, you know, give me a second. I want to talk to my family and, and kind of see where my mind is at because um, unlike baseball, soccer finishes in the fall and we're on the quarter system. So I still had the winter and the spring to, uh, to finish school. 
And, you know, I talked to my parents and I said, yeah, I'm not too sure if I want to continue or not to continue playing, but I don't know if I want to leave school because I'm not a great student and I have a great situation here with my friends. So probably best that I stay in school and, and not, you know, pursue my career because I need a degree. I'm so close to it. Two and a half quarters left. Let's just finish it off. So I called uh, the coach back and I said, hey, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I'm going to, you know, pursue my education and finish out my, my degree. He was not, he was very uh, kind of taken aback by it. Like, hey, the galaxy just came knocking and you're going to say no? Okay, sure, whatever. Kind of just hung up and, you know, I could tell that he was a little bit upset and kind of bitter. Uh, not bitter, but just upset about the whole situation. Like, I can't believe you just turned out the galaxy. But to me, it was the right decision. Um, I would finish off school. And then uh, I remember I needed to take one, uh, two more classes. So I had an extra quarter. So four years, four full years and one quarter. And so over that summer, I remember it was the first day of the World Cup. Uh, first, yeah, first day of the World Cup to, uh, 2014. And I was playing in this men's league game. They played me a through ball. I was on a one-on-one. Um, the goalkeeper was coming out. I stuck my le- I was a forward, stuck my leg out and uh, tried to cut. And my leg, my, my cleat got stuck in the ground. My body went like over my, bo- uh, over my knee and my leg hyperextended under me. And I tore my ACL right then and there. And, you know, it took me probably like two months until I got my surgery. But I think that right away triggered in my mind, like, oh, my God, did I just make a huge mistake of not going pro with the Galaxy or going to their, you know, going to their, their preseason? Like, what did I just do? So all of those little things started coming into your head. And then obviously you're not bedridden, but you really can't do the normal things because as goalkeepers, we need to have flexibility. We need to have our knee and, and you know, making sharp cuts. And because my, my ACL was torn, none of that was possible. So um, it was rough. Uh, um, I went about two months not playing, just kind of going to the gym and, and walking on the treadmill. And then I had to stay in my bed for about two and a half weeks. So with the surgery, with all that stuff and, and kind of like all of that regret weighing on me, uh, my mind just went crazy. Like, what, you know, what did I do? Why did I make that decision? And you start obviously contemplating your own mindset and trying to think of like, what if I had done it differently? What if I had just done this and all the hindsight in your mind? And, um, so it was rough. It was definitely rough. And trying to process my life without the game and without meaningful games, like I would go and play rec league and I would do all that stuff, but there was no meaning behind it. And people were very reckless. So they'll go into like crazy tackles. There was no like structure. And I really missed that, you know, having a, I had to rehab on my own. That's one thing that I miss in terms of structure. Whenever I had messed up my ankle or my wrist in college, they, I had a trainer who said, Hey, we're going to have this specific uh, plan for you. We're going to be back on the field in five days and in five weeks or whatever it was. So again, there's another little hole and void that I didn't have when I was going through my rehab of like actually having someone I was accountable to. So all this stuff started, you know, mounting up and, and I got to a point when I said, okay, you know, soccer is probably done. Um, let's be realistic now. And what else is next? So, you know, I was somebody who always wanted to try and make money too and like try and impress people. So I was trying to do, um, little projects that I had that I wanted to do, you know, music festival stuff. I wanted to be a DJ at one point. So I was buying a lot of DJ equipment. Um, so all this like crazy stuff just to make money. And I did that for about a year and a half. My knee, my knee was back to normal. So I was playing basketball and like, you know, I had come to terms with like, okay, my career is done. Um, but then, yeah, my mom, after about a year and a half of me kind of wasting my degree, you know, sat me down and said, look, you know, kind of ruthlessly, like we paid a lot of money for your degree and you're doing absolutely nothing with it. Sure. If you don't want to do something with your degree, just do something you love. Like we've seen you do all these jobs that you just aren't fulfilling for you. Let's, let's find you something that is actually going to, to make you happy and you're going to love and like wake up every morning and, and not lose interest in it, which is what I was doing. I had these projects that I would do for like a month, two months, and I would get over it. So they said, you know, get into coaching. And, you know, one thing led to another. Um, I started my, my Pro GK Academy channel in my backyard. My brother would, I would wake him up at like 6.30 in the morning and he needed like 30 minutes to wake up. So I was already out there warming up from 6.30 to 7. Um, and then he'd come back out. He'd have his cleats and I'd have like an old, you know, family camera and I'd set it on the tripod. And we started just filming. And I remember I was like, one of my videos blew up and it had like 5,000 views. And I was like so excited. I texted my family, like group chat. And I said, guys, like my video got to 5,000 views, which to me now is like not that much. But like then I was just like so, I just, I fell in love with like the process of like getting content out that would help people and putting out content that I wish I had when I was younger. So then I started a YouTube channel. Um, So yeah, I mean, once I was done playing, my mind obviously shut shut down and it was looking at other opportunities, other ways to make myself happy. 
But then again, like I talked to you earlier, it's like that beautiful game is just like, I'm just empty without it. Like I don't, I don't feel like my, even now in the quarantine time, my, my, my computer actually just crashed like five or six days ago. And I've been going so, so hard editing all the content that like my days are full and I feel good. And the last six days, my computer crashed on me. And like every day I have like, I'm trying to find meaning in my days without being able to edit content or like put out content. Um, so it's just been, it's been weird. And I think I'm just so like, I'm so into the game and I'm so into what I do that it's very, very hard for me to let go. So even this quarantine time, obviously I'm finding different ways to stay busy with goalkeeping stuff and getting content out, but being on the field, there's just nothing like it. Um, so yeah, that's a long answer for you, but yeah, essentially a lot of things, kind of not spiral out of control, but a lot of domino, you know, pieces fell because of the injury and because of my decision not to go into that uh, preseason with the galaxy, but everything kind of worked out the way it should have worked out. And again, in hindsight, it's 2020, but I really do feel like I'm doing what I need to do to either better myself and better the goalkeeping community, but feel like what I was meant to do. And I don't think a lot of people can say that. So um, through the negatives, the ups and downs, I feel like I'm, I'm doing what I was, you know, put on this earth to do as, as weird as that sounds. How were you able to come to terms with being done playing? You know, I don't think, I mean, I don't think you'd ever really come to terms with stuff like that. I think you just find different outlets and different ways to make you happy. Um, so I think that's one thing that I would recommend to any young goalkeeper out there is when you're playing, find hobbies, find things that are going to make you happy. You know, I know a lot of people who want to be dentists, doctors, lawyers, like those are things if you're in mock trial in school, like those are little hobbies that you kind of start um, being curious and, and sparking your curiosity of what you want to do when soccer's done. And I think that is something that parents can really bring up to their kids of like, look, soccer's not going to be there all the time. Let's figure out internships and things that you maybe want to do after you're done playing. And if you want to continue playing, then great. You at least have a fallback. Or you have an idea of what you want to do and pursue when you're done. Um, so to me, again, it, um, my brother and I were actually just talking about this recently is that we remember only what we want to remember as, as we get older. So we forget all those little life lessons that we had to go through uh, in those moments. So for me, I could tell you that, you know, yes, I found my calling and I found what I needed to do, but I went through kind of hell for, let's say almost a year and a half to two years of trying to figure out what I wanted to do and um, understanding that hard work and actually, you know, sinking your teeth into something is what's going to make you successful, not trying to be rich or trying to, you know, come off with, you know, get rich quick schemes or, um, anything like that. I think anything in life that you that you want to really succeed at and that you really want to um, find find passion and real love in, you have to do it for a good amount of time before you know if it's right for you. And I think that was what I found through all this. But like I told my brother, yes, there have been times where I was so low that I thought about, you know what, forget this. Like I'm just gonna get a desk job and make ten, fifteen dollars an hour, and then that's that's gonna be the rest of my life because I can't take this adversity or I can't take this uh, this hardship. But once you start finding, because you, you have trial and error, once you start trying a lot of things and like are curious about a lot of things, then eventually you go, oh my God, like I like that. And I also like this. Okay, if no one's offering it, perfect. Let me create an avenue for myself. So for me, I love goalkeeping. I love educating goalkeepers. Not a lot of people were doing it. Okay, I love editing content too. I love putting videos together. I'm, a good, I'm good at Photoshop. I'm good at editing. Boom, okay, let's make this happen. So I think, again, being curious, uh, is one thing, but also to figuring out what it is you want to do after after you're done playing that can fill that void. And I think that's what I've done for myself. So how did you decide to start your podcast as well? Early on, it was all video content. Um, and you guys know Michael Magid, who's kind of like a mentor for me because he's uh, he and I work in, in business together. Um, and he's like, he's on, pretty much my manager now. So he and I, you know, we're chatting one day and he said, look, you know, we have a podcast. This is like a year and a half ago. He's like, we have a podcast do you want to join? And I was like, Oh, I'm not much of a podcast person, but yeah, it's like, I have video content. I have uh, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, but I don't have like a podcast where my voice can be heard and I can share my ideas. So he reached out to me. I did one or two with him and I said, Oh my God, this is actually really fun. Like I really enjoy this because the topics that are being discussed and the coaches that are coming on sports psychologists, like we were interviewing a wide range of people and yeah, over about a year and a half, we, it, it grew to being one of like the biggest podcasts, uh, uh, you know, in, in the goalkeeping industry. And for us, it was just something that we love to do again, at the, the bare minimum for anything you do should be that you love it. 
So we were interviewing like three, four guests a week. And like during World Cup stuff, we were on top of stuff, releasing content like daily. And so that was the fun part. And like Mike uh, really sparked my interest in, in that. And then at that time, I said, hey, you know, I, I kind of want to step away from inside the 18 just for a little bit, just because I kind of want to do longer form pieces where I can speak on my own experiences. And then when I speak to coaches, I want to get to know why, like, why do you have a philosophy? Why, why is your demeanor, your personality, you know, why is your temperament the way that it is? And a lot of those coaches from their playing careers, from their coaching careers, have gone through crazy experiences that us goalkeepers and goalkeeper coaches have go- are currently going through. So I kind of wanted to step away from inside the 18. I'm kind of back with them now, but I stepped away for a few months just to kind of, you know, sink my teeth into that kind of project of understanding other people's stories. And I was kind of tired of hearing my own voice. And, you know, I, when you talk, you can only hear what you know and hear what you have to say. But when you give other people the platform to talk, you learn so much about what they have to offer and their experiences. And again, it might spark something in your mind and go, oh my God, I'm going through that right now with my, you know, U15 goalkeeper who's not listening. This is how Anna, you know, used it with her goalkeeper. Oh my God, I'm going to apply that. So I think that has been the beauty of having the podcast is just to get to know people and um, hear different ideas and thoughts. And I think that's helped me grow, and especially in this quarantine time. So I think we've made it to our final question. What do you hope people will remember about your impact to soccer and the world? You know what? I have, I mean, I've really been thinking about this lately just because, you know, we have so much free time now to think, but I don't know. I think, you know, right now with the state of social media or like goalkeeping and actually, you know, field player stuff on social media, it's very rare that you find people who are in it for the right reasons. Um, And what I mean by that is that the content that they're producing isn't for their own bottom line. It's to help other people. Um, And a quote that I heard from a motivation, not a motivational speaker, but a business guy that I listen to, he says, it's legacy over currency. Um, and I know for a fact that with my following, I could, you know, I can make a lot of money doing ads and, and getting money from people and posting content that isn't very useful, but I've kind of just made, you know, I've come to terms with it and made, made peace with it and realized, look, like there are people out there who are probably going to like that, you know, that viral content. But for me personally, like I want to do what my mission statement was from day one is to provide content and provide platforms for, for coaches and for goalkeepers to, to learn things that I didn't have as a kid growing up. And I really wish that people had gone in depth with it. Um, and like, even for example, like Joe Hart, he has a podcast and the podcast on YouTube, like doesn't have that many views, but it, I, I've watched like three or four times and it's helped me so much. So even somebody like Joe Hart, who is England's number one for many, many years is considered one of the best goalkeepers in the world at one point, he's not getting that many views for his content. Like it gives me peace of mind knowing that like, it's going to come because there are people out there who eventually are going to get tired of that viral content of people diving over ropes, of people diving through, you know, hula hoops or whatever the case may be. And I want to be on the right side of history. And I really feel like making that sacrifice of understanding that the money will come and the opportunities will come. But the important thing is to develop the brand a certain way. And the image that I want to portray of myself is that I want to be an educator. I want to be someone that like, you know, throws something at you with every post that I have on social media that's going to make you think whether it's a technique that you don't know about and you go, Oh my God, maybe I can apply that or a coach. And you hear something about, you know, sports psychology or you just anything that's going to make you think. And I think that is what my, I want my legacy to be is somebody who is, you know, put their own um, aspirations of money and things aside and really just put at the forefront education um, and learning and, and having a resource for kids who don't have the money to go out and get a coach. And I think that is for me where I'm at now, where I have a decent following, but for me, it's more about quality than quantity. I can have a hundred thousand followers, but you know, uh, barely any of them care about what I'm posting and I can have a hundred followers and all of them are really into it and really love the discussions and are DMing me or, you know, giving me calls, um, about, Hey, let's get on a zoom call. Let's chat about that last post you had. And to me, that's kind of what I'm after now. And I think, again, you have to go through that trial and error where you have to make those mistakes. Cause at one point I was like, okay, I see the algorithm. I know how I can make money. I know how I can get uh, more views and more likes and build this brand up to what I want to be. But then at a certain point you go, okay, you know, Hey, why am I in this? And you have people around you who say, Omar, why, why are you, you know, why are you selling out or why are you doing this? So I think that is, you know, to answer your question to me is, is making sure that people understand that I'm in it for the right reasons. Um, and if, if I can inspire a young goalkeeper or a young goalkeeper coach to, 
you know, take some of my drills or they share some of their drills for me. And we were both having a discussion about, Hey, why did you, why did you do this? Or why are you teaching that with your goalkeepers? Then, I mean, you saw it now with the quarantine, everybody's sharing everything. And I think at that point we need to keep it like this, keep this same energy every single day, not just in times like this every single day so that the goalkeeper coaches benefit. And then because the goalkeeper coaches are benefiting the younger goalkeepers who are, you know, coming up the ranks here in the U S and all around the world are also benefiting. I am so glad I took the time to learn about Omar. I know he talked about making some tough choices along the way, like when he didn't go pro. Sometimes we make those decisions and we don't know why or we might not be sure then, but later on we know we made the right choice. When Omar got injured, he could have easily given up or could have gone and done another job that didn't seem like as good of a fit. Instead, he stuck with it and trusted this is what he needed to do. Omar is a really great guy. I know he will do whatever he can to help me or anyone else who crosses his path. And until I see you next week, remember to keep the game beautiful. <laughs>